So today, we are talking about the child archetype. And the child archetype, in my opinion, is the creative person, and that's all of us, that's everybody. Child archetype is creativity's best friend. And I have come to believe that it's also the key to staying forever young. Now, let's talk about archetypes a minute here. Excuse me again. Pema. I might have to throw something at her. Yeah, wake up. Sorry about that. Don't you just love live TV? Okay, you cannot knock me off because I used to teach children this age. And the child archetype is one of a pantheon of archetypes and archetypes for those of you who are rather new to this and a review for those of you who are already old uh, seasoned archetypal souls. Archetypes are patterns of human behavior. They are not ghosts. They are not beings. They are patterns that we all recognize because we, over the course of the lifetimes, become so familiar with the patterns that people manifest. And so it's a shorthand for that. And when we say, wow, she's such an earth mother, we get an image. And when we say, wow, that guy is just a Don Juan, we get an image. And when we say, you've got a big gambler happening and you better be careful, we know what that means. And there are loads and loads of archetypes and we don't all necessarily resonate to every archetype. I think I said last week in talking about them that archetypes are a little bit like uh, uh, visitors sometimes, or I was actually using the analogy of cats on my porch when I was feeding all the feral cats in the neighborhood. Some of them stayed, some of them left, some of them were on their good behavior and they came in the house. That's kind of a crazy way that you'll always remember of thinking about archetypes because some are just passing through town and some are with you your entire life. And there are four archetypes that are with you your entire life. And those are what Caroline Mace coined this term, the survival archetypes. So I'm a big fan of how she characterized all of this. And I've taken it into my own little world of creativity because that's my baby. But what, what's important to know here is that there are four survival archetypes and each of these archetypes has a lesson to teach us that will help us become um, acclimated and authentic and self-confident adults. And the child is the easiest one to talk about. And so we start with this little four pack that's my granddaughter in the yellow, because the child is the guardian of innocence and the guardian of your imagination. It is your opportunity to learn to be responsible when needed while still retaining the qualities of innocence and imagination. And unfortunately, what frequently happens is that the child begins to get sort of tamped down, partly because of socialization, which needs to happen. We all need to know to the best of our ability how to interact with other human beings. And so some of that is just part of living in a tribe. And part of it is a good thing because that's what helps us learn to be civil Although recently I would question that, but we won't go there. But the guardian, the child is teaching us to be civil and it's also teaching us not to lose or trade innocence and imagination because those qualities will keep us young and will keep life joyful and exuberant and help us find moments of pleasure. Now within the subset of the child archetype, there are aspects, okay? So it's sort of like being on the continuum here. 
And the nature child is one that a lot of people can really relate to. The nature child loves being outdoors, loves playing, loves animals, but you can't just love animals. You have to feel, here's how to determine what, what your major child archetype is because you can relate to each of them as I go through them here, but there's usually one that's dominant. And the one that's dominant is easy to track back because it probably began to feel, feels familiar because it manifested when you were as young as six or seven or eight. And this is random, but do you, if you have seen or have had any contact in the past with the um, fabulous musical, which was way ahead of its time called South Pacific, it was a story of soldiers in the South Pacific during World War II. And one of the songs that was in this musical was you've got to be taught to hate and fear. And here's what's critical in our conversation. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, because that's the formative time, not only for to hate all the, rel all the people your relatives hate, you've got to be carefully taught. That's when prejudices are forming. That's when we're getting ideas about what the world around us is like. And that is the period of time, six, seven, and eight, when we start to uh, connect to the parts of, of the world around us that are going to stick with us and enhance our imagination for the rest of our lives. And so I just loved this picture with this young boy and the chicken. The nature child wants everything to grow. A sweet potato in the window, wants to nurture animals. It's not just a connection, it's that they are part and parcel of your entire life. And she didn't get to go with me on that particular trip, but she sure knew how to get in there, hammy, and lay on top of all my samples so that when I unpack my suitcase, and if you haven't already guessed, I'm a nature child. I saw that cat hair, it didn't bother me. I thought it was a love letter. The magical child is the part of us that's specifically in touch with imagination. The magical child loves terrariums and inner worlds and loves mystical things, loves to goof off and pretend and play and act out in the best possible sense of the word, and loves the lights and the color of the midway and the theme park and feeling as though in this particular ride you can fly high above the ground, although you will never be a bird. Children in general, but magical children in specifics, love carousels and love the lights and the colors and bubbles and the idea that there could be this enchanting world beyond us. But the good thing about magical children is that they are also, this aspect of the child embodies wisdom and courage in the face of difficult circumstances. And so Anne Frank is often used as an example of a magical child who despite everything she went through and that everything that ended her life, she was still able to write in one of her, in her diary that she believed at the core that people were basically decent and good. The wounded child carries, and you know, as I said, there are little bits of all of these, I suppose, in each of us. Even if you had an upbringing that was very loving in a very warm environment, there are things other kids did, there are events that could have happened that introduced the wounded child. And we need to have been in touch or to be in touch with the wounded child because here's the thing about an archetype there's the light side that's upbeat and positive and helps us appreciate nature and helps us connect to the magical spiritual part of life. And that's all wonderful. The dark side is the side that keeps us wounded our entire lives. 
or grounds our creativity because of self-doubt. And so each of, of these aspects of the child archetype is an opportunity not only to celebrate the light upbeat part of what it represents, but also to see the lessons of the darker shadow side. And the, the shadow side of the wounded child is the fact that if you've never been wounded, which isn't true for anybody listening to this right now, we've all been wounded. It does give us the opportunity to mature into the kind of a person who is willing to forgive. So perhaps the hard lesson of the wounded child is to be able to forgive experiences of the past. But you know, the elephant in the room is that sometimes forgiveness is a very difficult thing, if not impossible, and that takes effort. And I believe that creativity can help with that healing. The orphaned child, I did not know until I started to put this particular presentation together, wasn't on my radar that the orphan child is actually kind of an iconic subject matter for artwork over the years, and we'll see that. But the orphan child is literally without parents, without guidance. And sometimes because of your situation in your growing up, you could feel when you look at this as though you were an orphan, even when you were in a family. And so we have to allow that possibility to exist. But one of the things about orphan children, and especially in literature and in real life, I found out by researching, is that orphan children often overcome the orphaning in such a way that they do great things for the rest of humanity. And Harry Potter is the classic example of the orphan child who changed everybody's lives, including all the readers, because of his story. I did not know Steve Jobs was an orphan. His father was Muslim. He was the product of an illegitimate uh, birth or, or tryst and his mother gave him up for adoption. I think that's really fascinating on a lot of levels. But I also think that the parents who adopted him loved him and gave him a head start that turned him into one of the most uh, influential people of, of the century. And he's holding up that picture of Marilyn Monroe because she was also orphaned and tossed around from home to home. And she didn't, as, as gorgeous and beautiful and brilliant as she was, and if you don't think that, you should read her autobiography. Being orphaned and being female undid her in a way that Steve Jobs was able to overcome. If you look at art, both contemporary and classic, you can see all kinds of examples that represent child archetypes because childhood is one of the most painted and sculpted and previewed topics in the art world. This is a famous painting, Carnation Lily, Lily Rose by John Singer Sargent, one of my favorites. I used to have a poster of this on the bedroom wall. What's more magical than the darkness and lighting those lanterns? Pablo Picasso's painting of his daughter, Maya. And what I read about this is that he was, although he was obviously a really difficult son of a bitch when it came to his wives, he loved his children and he loved her. Isn't it interesting that the doll has the real face and Maya has the face that is um, an example of his cubist um, painting style. And in this case, I thought it was a perfect example of how complex personalities are to have painted her in this cubist way. Now we have a sad little nature child. I don't know who's more unhappy, the cat or the, the little girl. 
So their representative paintings and, and artwork of nature children galore. Mary Cassatt's two little girls on the beach enjoying the sand and also building. That's see, there's the nature and the magical child combined. Beautiful painting by Frederick Morgan, 1885, of a little girl feeding the ducks with such compassion and love on her face. That's when you know you're a nature child. When, whether you'll admit it or not, you would rather be with animals than human beings. Dorothea Sharp, a wonderful uh, UK painter, also from that era, um, early 20th century and the little girl with the fabulous doves. We could spend hours dissecting these paintings in terms of symbolism and it would be really interesting. So I'm really just giving you an overview. Now, I am such a fan of him and I just found him. His name is gonna pop up in a minute, but here's a beautiful Nate. Isn't this such a perfect symbolic representation of possibly the abandoned child, although she does not look unhappy, but the nature child, totally at ease. Kevin Peterson, because he's done, a, he's very prolific. He's a Houston, Texas artist. This painting actually won the $50,000 um, art prize in Texas in 2017, I believe, but how poignant and symbolic is this as a representative image for the abandoned child or the orphan? And how desperate and sad and poignant and perfect is this from the UK artist, Kathy Wilkes, who has spent her entire career putting together installations like this. And in this particular one, I could not think of a better, better example of abandonment than the image that she created. I think I mentioned that orphans were a popular subject matter. I had no idea. Thomas Benjamin Kennington, this is again back in like, this must've been something Victorian. 1885 or 1890, beautiful painting. Look at that darling boy. But here's a contemporary version. You may or may not, if you're not, go and Google <clears throat> the Terracotta Warriors. The Terracotta Warriors were in, in China, buried and eventually discovered. Huge, huge installation. Prune Nuri from France, did this installation and she calls it the terracotta daughters. She got the same clay, she used the same technique. She built models from eight young girls who had all been abandoned by their parents because they were the firstborn and they were girls. And in China there was is a policy of one child. And when the one child is not a boy, the girls are abandoned and sometimes even left in the garbage. One of the girls that modeled for this particular piece when it was made was rescued by the garbage collector and the umbilical cord was still attached. What could be a worse sense of abandonment than that? And so you see that there is a way to make light of the archetypes but there is also a, a, a vein that runs very deep with these things into the human psyche. And the good news is that these girls represent girls who were adopted and loved. And we can only hope that that policy will change. But in the meantime, the girls represented in this installation, which is actually 108 girls because there were 108 of the terracotta warriors, those girls have the potential to change the world. And that's what the child archetype does, keeps you in touch with your imagination and your innocence and works with other archetypes so that you can get brave. 
Scott Erickson, I discovered him, a uh, successful painter, went to Swaziland because of what he read and started to work literally with orphans, giving them paint and they painted and they were happy. Look at that little girl's eyes, happy to be painting. And then he turned their paintings into artwork by superimposing his own drawings on top of the paintings that had been done by the children. And then those were offered for sale. And that project has raised thousands of dollars for the orphanages in Swaziland, which was struck very hard by the AIDS epidemic and of course by famine and drought. Just another way that art gives back in one of the most profound demonstrations of love and connection to other beings on the planet that is available to us. So how does understanding the child archetype nurture your creative self? When I have a question like that, I take it directly to my people. And my people are my community, the creative strength training members of 2020. And we were just about on the verge of shutting down. We couldn't communicate, we couldn't plan stuff. And you know what? COVID could have gotten the better of us, but it didn't. And one of the things that came out of COVID was the fact that we realized we could do exhibitions from our membership, gave them a chance to show their work, gave us a chance to put together this catalog designed by Kay Wayne Harms. And it gives us a chance to share all that work with other people who will tune in and possibly, as has already happened, buy some work. So I'm just gonna share a few pages because the reason this is important to our conversation right now is that the people who are involved in this particular exhibition, as is true of everyone in CST for the whole year, these particular people chose to begin a series that focused on archetypes. And these are the piece, some of the pieces that were in the exhibition, there were more, but I couldn't fit them all in. These are some of the pieces that were specifically either about the child archetype or were inspired by the child archetype, meaning work that's playful. And this is Anita Centeno. She worked with little Altoid tins for the whole program this year. She made these fabulous little sculptures, installations using shrink wrap and washi tape and found objects. And this child archetype, as a matter of fact, let's see, I pulled this out so I could just read a bit to you. In the depiction of the child archetype, I equate dancing with that freeing childlike quality that says, get your party dress on, get your dancing shoes on. The sun is singing, so you should dance your heart out. And that's the thing I love about all of this is that the symbols, the things that Annie came up with to put in her beautiful piece are not what anybody else would come up with. We are all working with the child archetype, but they're all different. The symbolism is different and how we interpret it is distinctive. And that is what artists want to be able to achieve. And that is what we set out to help people do. So here's Jeanette Davis. And I couldn't do any better than to read what she wrote about this piece. My challenge as an artist is to use imagery symbolically to evoke the felt experience of otherness. That interest evolved as being part of a bicultural identity. I am now referred to as a person of color. The inspiration for this piece was the orphan and the magical child archetype because I was figuratively born straddling two worlds. Marilyn George from New Zealand, Peace Child. This piece, P-I-E-C-E, -E, represents picking up crayfish out of the creek and stamps that mark the end of the world and a little picture of her nurtured by the bush 
where she grew up. It's the same bush that nurtures her now. And so you see how each of us has this vast treasure trove of imagery and ideas and words that we can refer to or delve into in order to come up with our own version of, it's not only about archetypes, it's about any artwork you're making. You just figure it out and learn it here and then expand it to whatever topic interests you. Leela's piece, The Nature Child, similar and completely different. So photographic imagery transferred onto the cloth, collage together here with elements that she connects to as relating to her nature child, including the owl and maybe a fox on the left. But see, it's all about her. She's making it for herself and then the rest of us benefit. Marilyn Waite did this particular piece to address the fact that she'd had an ongoing dream that was part of her claiming herself and actually, I think, retrieving her child. And you see from this work that it does not have to be pictorial or figurative every time. And it can be fanciful as is true of this piece of Pam Lowe's, which was inspired by the foliage and the plants and the Spanish moss and all of that in South Florida when she went to visit her grandmother as a child. So all kinds of fabulous inspirations and stories can come up in your imagination and your memory. And that's what can come together so that you're capable of making work using your tools that is as good as anything you see here. Kristen Rohr works with a kind of an interesting way of closing her eyes and stitching and then opening her eyes after she has stitched a while and adding to the stitched piece based on the theme that she's chosen. And so you can see this ranges into a realm that is completely abstract from some of the things I've shown you. And yet it's still characteristic for her, especially this is her child. Linda Nelson Johnson, you don't notice the shadow at first of the child there looking into the ladybug garden. And yet I expect that's a memory that many of us have had masterfully executed. Zoe Holsneck works in polymer clay. Lots of people don't work in fabric, so that's not an absolute. I should have shown some of Kelly Hoffman's fabulous work also in polymer clay, but vessels instead. But here we have another representation, an inspiration, a response to what the child means for Zoe. And there's a nice interview with her on my website that I hope you'll look for and make time to watch. And now we're back to playful and figurative and Photoshop and I can, Sherry. So another example of the opportunities that we have to use the tools that are already at our disposal or to learn how to do something new. And I close because I've been working since the fall Fall for me, spring for those of you other places. I always want to acknowledge that. I've been working on a series of archetype cards. And so this is, is a card that's part of a deck that I've created and they're, they're four by six. And <coughs> I've been discerning what the symbolic language of each of the archetypes is for me. And then I've been looking for those elements in my own photos my own photographs, and sometimes online, sometimes in vintage bird books, which is true of the little tip mouse down in the right-hand corner. I have an old dictionary and I cut apart the pages to find the words I need. You wouldn't have to have any skills that relate to Photoshop in order to do this. It could be completely collaged, like Annie Centeno's um, tins. But it's a great opportunity with the deck to think about symbolically what the various archetypes represent to you. And if you're more inclined to work um, abstractly, 
then you just work with color and form. There's no obligation for it to be figurative. I hope some of what I've shown you has proved that point. Kristen Rohr's stitching is certainly not something that would automatically tell a story of the child archetype, which is the beautiful thing about art in a general sense is that we have an opportunity to use whatever skills we have, whatever tools we're comfortable with. It can be figurative, it can be impressionistic, it can be photographic, it can be abstract. But the symbolism is still available to us. It's only a matter of how we tap it and how we learn to use it. And that's part of the ongoing conversation that we want to have in CST in order to help people achieve their best potential. And it all begins with the child. It all begins with the child. And we each have one. So let me open up the Q&A and see if I've got some things to answer here, things, questions. I've been watching um, this crazy PBS show that's Dr. Seuss with my three and a half year old granddaughter. Okay, so give me a break here. And of course he had thing one and thing two. And if you're not a Dr. Seuss fan, sorry about that. But if you like Dr. Seuss, don't forget about thing one and thing two, because they're very useful, but they're not useful when you're trying to be an articulate adult. Okay, so let's go to open questions. Okay, how do we get the recordings from your website, Cassie? Uh, if you go to the homepage, they should be there. Zena was in the process of adding some and she may not have them all there yet, but I do believe you can go to vimeo.com and type in Jane Dunawald and anything that's public will pop up there just sort of like YouTube, except not YouTube. And that you should be able to see, for example, last week, uh, how is CST like corn? It's a little corny, but it worked for me. I grew up in the Midwest, corn works for me. Um, you should be able to go and look there. And if you can't, like I know for sure, that the interviews with a couple of people who volunteered to interview are there now. These will be added to that. And so you may have to check back on my website and just you know, remember that we're, uh, we're a small team and we're babysitting right now. And there's a lot going on and I hate excuses. So just give me a little time, but it'll be there. Okay, Melissa. Can we know when the class next year starts and what day or time the sessions are scheduled? Okay, this is an ongoing thing. Registration opens January 1st. The program officially begins March 1st. And during that two month in between time, we're providing essays and some videos and some stuff to help new people get, up, get caught up or get up to speed because people paid for last year, they will have other events going on up till March 1st. But um, then we'll all converge on March 1st. And what will happen is that on March 1st, boom, you get a link to 12 documents and videos. It's just gonna be like opening the biggest holiday package or maybe your best birthday ever, because that's how we always do it. On the first of the month, a whole bunch of links and tutorials are made available on the topic of the month. And you have access to that. All, you've got access to that for the rest of the program. But you can look at like when March opens, you'll be able to take your time, read all of March, look at all the tutorials. Then we'll start sending announcements about Zoom meetings that are coming up so you can stay connected that way. So it's really, uh, I don't know, I don't want this to scare anybody, but in a way it's kind of a lifestyle. It's like there are things to read and things to do and it's up to you, introvert or extrovert, how involved you wanna be with it. But then there'll be meetings that are recorded Zoom meetings and you can attend those and sit back in the corner in the dark and sip your tea if you want to, or you can be right out there in front asking questions. I want what you want, but that's how it works. So there isn't really, it's not like every Wednesday we meet at five o'clock. 
although the Zoom meetings to, do tend to get onto a regular schedule because we have these other meetings that are kind of accountability groups that people join. And sometimes they're around a particular idea. And I can't go into more about that right now because that's still evolving. But we wanna make it work out so that people can be in on whatever meetings they want. But here's the really good news, it's all recorded. So if you were Howard Hughes, a lot of people probably don't remember him. He was a total recluse because he was so wealthy, he got really paranoid. And he, I don't know why I'm telling you this. And he was afraid people were gonna take advantage of him. So he lived by himself until literally what I read that freaked me out, this is over 20 years ago, he, his fingernails grew so long, he couldn't even really use his hands. That's, that's an introvert. I don't think anybody in this group is gonna ever be that kind of introvert, but the fact is, if you were a Howard Hughes sort of introvert, oh God, I'm probably gonna regret this. But if you were, you could watch everything all the time, the Zoom meetings, all of it, and never participate at all. I'm not calling you up saying, where are you? Guilt trip, guilt trip, I just don't do that. So there are a lot of ways to participate. And I, one way is to get out there and really meet some other people and have fun with it through the Zoom meetings. But the other way, really, if what you wanna do is read and you're happy doing that, then do, do that. How often do you get permission just to do whatever you want to do? And it's all okay. And that's part of what I'm about. And that's part of what I want you to experience by being engaged with CST and me. Okay. Uh, dark side of the nature child. Glad you asked that question, Tracy. I happen to have the book right here. The dark side of the nature child manifests in a tendency to abuse animals and people and the environment. And I would guess that it probably also links with the saboteur in ways that shut down your ability to create. But if the positive side of the nature, always think about the light side. The light side of any archetype is the side that lifts up and honors. So in this case, we're lifting up and protecting and taking care of nature. And the dark side of the nature child has been damaged in some way that undoes nature or is not mindful or litters or fill, fill in the blank. Michelle, can the child switch from nature child to mis uh, Yes, absolutely. There, I think probably we all have moments when we feel most of the um, aspects of the, the child archetype. So you're not always feeling like a magical child. And I think the magical child and the nature child kind of wind together and then they connect with your artist, which is often true for people. And that sometimes when we feel outside of things, that's triggered by feeling some um, abandonment thing that maybe nobody really meant to happen to us, but we felt that way about it, which goes back to why we talk about the committee and understanding how the critic and the committee can run roughshod over us because we allow it to happen. It's all intention. Um, so I, I think that sometimes when abandonment or you've had a, a good family, but you still feel kind of orphaned, maybe you always felt like you weren't as loved as the other two kids or you're, they liked your sister better or, you know, I, it's, this is not armchair psychology, so I can't go there. I refuse to go there and I don't want anyone to think these are therapy sessions because that would not be correct. But I do think that most of us are intelligent enough to recognize when things have happened to us and to analyze that with a new perspective. And that's what I think is valuable about what we attempt to do. So I can see where sometimes I'm a nature child and sometimes I'm a magical child. It's so fluid. If you're still breathing, this is all fluid. And that means that sometimes you can feel orphaned or abandoned and it's important to figure out why that is because the light side of that rises. So you were feeling abandoned, but now you're succeeding. It's all about self-esteem. You were feeling orphaned and as though you were left for whatever set of circumstances to yourself, but now you're transcending that. And so 
The goal in general with archetypes, as far as I personally am concerned, is that it gives us tools to see where there are low spots in how we feel about ourselves. And then the low spot always has a positive higher spot. And it helps us identify what that is so that then we can intentionally work to getting there and community, talking about it with other people who are speaking your language is part of getting there. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, Tracy, go for it. She's saying, can I resolve my wounded child and pick an upbeat one? Yeah, get your magical child to jump in there. That's what good friends do. Some of us are only child with no brothers or sisters. My only child doesn't feel like an abandoned child. Onlys are never just abandoned and they're never orphans. Sometimes they're dearly beloveds. And then they have opportunities to be magical and nature oriented and sometimes even divine because they've had that sort of background and we don't all, we can't all claim that's true and it would be false to act as though we could. But I think that when you, I certainly raised my daughter to feel as though, and here's the thing that, I, that might've gotten lost in the conversation. So the child is about innocence and it's about imagination, but it's also about learning to be responsible because the dark side of the child archetype overall is refusing to grow up and refusing to take responsibility and or defaulting into victimization where somebody else is always calling the shots. These are the things that can go wrong. And so if, if anybody felt that as though someone else was always calling the shots or poor me, poor me, poor me, mm, 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 negative uh, indication, need to do a little work on getting the positive child back. So that because part of self-esteem is feeling as though you can handle things. So helicopter parents are not always doing a real good thing because children have to learn to succeed and they learn to succeed by failing some of the time or by having parents or significant other adults who help them uh, get past with what has happened that didn't work out and see what the next, you know, stand up, dust yourself off. That's what that whole phrase is all about. And parents who have only children may not necessarily be cognizant of that, but I do think that a lot of people who have only children, you've got two choices, really. You can, unfortunately, the child can turn out to be a really spoiled child who always expects everybody to do for them. And that, that's the shadow side of the only child, I suppose, now that we're talking about it, Janice. The light side of the only child is feeling empowered and as though you were always loved, which gives you even more strength and resiliency and sense of capability. And for only children, that's really valuable because then maybe they can reach out to other children and by combining with other archetypes, be stewards of growth and creative expression for others. Barbara, would you explain more about the wounded child? Um, yeah. I think there, we all know this, there are degrees. I can remember at least three things. My Well, I'll tell you one. When I was, I don't know, nine, I had a hammer and I was pounding something and I hit my thumb and I said, this stupid hammer. My dad said, it's not the hammer. So I interpreted that as I was stupid. That would like my granddaughter says now, ha ha. We don't say stupid. So that's an example of being such a sensitive child that 60 years later, well, not quite 60, 50 years later, that still resonates with me. I can still think about it and have a twinge. So that's, but my parents were basically good parents and tried to do the right thing and loved me. And 
that was probably more about me being a sensitive child than it was about anything else. But on the other hand, we have children who have been routinely left to their own devices without any guidance, have felt as though they had to make their whole way from childhood into adulthood on their own and that the adults around them were either distracted or, uh, you know, drunk or just not, not invested. And that can cause a whole deeper level of feeling abandoned. And so I think it's up to each of us. And sometimes if that's really resonating with anyone who's watching me right now, a therapist would be a really great person to talk to. I can't solve those problems in CST. I can only help you address anything that is in your past through the symbolic working out from a creative standpoint. Now that can still be risky, but that's safe territory. I'm not a counselor. And so the wounded child I think exists on that continuum is my point. And it's up to each of us to acknowledge where we were and then to figure out what would really, and sometimes, you know, you can think about that and say, that's why that happened. And you can heal immediately just because you had the recognition that it happened. And so there are a lot of possibilities around the things that CST and archetypal study helps you think about because it's a language that can give you clarity and understanding. And then that releases your creativity and that's why I'm sitting here and that's what this is about. Kristen escaping the real world too much. Maybe that was a response to what she said about the wounded child. Not quite sure what you meant by that, but possibly when, when the world's too hard to, to take, it's easy to, I know I did, I ran in the woods and hung out in the woods all the time because I didn't, you know, whatever. We all have, if, if, if you were interested in escaping from the world around you because it was too difficult or it, it was just easier to be somewhere else, then that could be a sign of, I suppose, having some level of being wounded. Kathy, bossy child, shy child, bully child, are these variations, der derivations of the four archetypes that you've identified? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. yes, I think probably so. Because here's the thing, that's a really, really great question. Here's the thing, you're not born into life with just a child archetype, and then when you're 12, suddenly you get the rest, okay? Um, and if you're not that familiar with the archetypes in general, that would not be so obvious to you. But the idea is, which you can either accept or not, that we each have the four survival archetypes. And just for clarity, we all have a victim and the victim protects one part of our self-esteem. And then we all have a prostitute. We have to know what our values are and it protects our faith in ourselves and in the world around us. And then we have the saboteur and the saboteur is about boundaries and protecting another aspect of what it's like to become an adult. And the child, as I've said, is the innocence. Then in addition to that, just for the sake of the model posed by Carolyn Mace, we have kind of a birth collective of partnerships with eight other archetypes that really feel like comfortable for us. And if we, if we read through either Caroline Mace's book or online, or there are a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there. We resonate with some more than we resonate with others. Like I don't really have a dilettante and I don't really have a bully, but I have a huge damsel in distress and I have a huge gambler and I have a huge rebel. And so one of the interesting things about analyzing your own self using the archetypes is that it's almost like you have a cast of characters who have invested in your life and have been there to work out various interactions that you have with other people as a way you could, it's almost like it's the stage play of your life. And so if a kid is a bully, a child is a bully, then probably 
the bully archetype came in with them. And if a child is shy, I'm not quite sure where to put that one right now. And I'm not going to pigeonhole it because it would be, that would make it sound too uh, pack, pat, and it's not. It's, it's complex. But if somebody's really bossy, we think about what I would have to think about what I relate to bossy as a character type, like a know it all might be bossy, firstborn might be bossy. So I would start looking at it and analyzing it from that standpoint. But my the only point I really need to make right now before we move on, Kathy, is that I think other archetypes are impacting each other and interacting with each other. So it's never the child standalone. And it's never the prostitute standalone or the rebel standalone. They're working basically as a team. And some of them, sometimes some of them have stronger roles to play on the stage and some of them aren't on the stage at all. And so if you think about your entire life as a stage play in the way that I've just described it, you may never have had a miser in your life at all. And suddenly the miser's wandering on the stage and is there for some short period of time. And maybe that's a lesson for you to learn about how many art supplies you're buying or how you're using them, or I got it, I just flashed on it. Are they in a drawer? Cause they're too precious to use. That's when you're getting a little message from the miser. And that's, and remember, they're not calling you up on the phone. This is not a bank of people who live in some big building somewhere. These are projections from our own imagination. So archetypes are actually a language that is bona fide example of your creativity at work and your ability to understand yourself because of that process. Oh, Rhoda, if you sign up, do you have access to prior year's handouts and videos? As a matter of fact, man, <laughs> what do you have the uh, prescient uh, something miser in your head? This week, we've been talking about the fact that we're going to archive all of the essays, uh, not every single thing we've ever done, because it goes back a long time now. But we are going to create an archive this year that will be available for anybody who has signed up to the program. And I think that'll be really useful because if there are four different essays I've written on archetypes, um, which there are every every year a different one because I don't go back and read and I don't just change a few words, you know, that's, that'd be cheating. My three and a half year old granddaughter said to me yesterday, do you know what cheating is? Ha ha. I said, no. But how does she know? What's cheating? Cheating is when you are um, like, you don't like your green beans and you wait till somebody turns away and then you put them in the sink. And I said, is that what you just did? And she said, well, it's okay. If you didn't want to eat your green beans, it's all right. Ha ha, you know what else cheating is? It's when one of your friends says something and then you act like you said it. I thought, wow. That's pretty straightforward. There are a lot of artists who should be familiar with that explanation of cheating, right? So doesn't this prove that at three and a half, we know we've got this stuff figured out. We just forget it. And then we work all our lives to get it back. All the good golden rules. Yeah, so the videos are gonna be available. Light side to the wounded child is learning how to forgive and learning to move beyond the wounds because we are all wounded in some way. And if we wallow in that, we lose precious time and we cannot make the most of the rest of our lives. So it does not matter what it is. I've got a little saying downstairs that says, did you know you can start over any time? And that means right now, what could be better than that? Let's see. Oh, hi, Lynn, the fourth archetype. Oh, well, you're talking about the child archetype. So there are various aspects of the child archetype. You have nature, magical, and wounded. And then there was also uh, orphaned. And then there's also, which I haven't talked about much today, there are two more. One is the eternal boy or girl, the eternal like Peter Pan that never grew up. I had to kind of winnow it down to the ones I thought were most um, 
relevant to creativity and, and what, what I'm talking about. And the other one is the divine child and the divine child in Christian um, culture would be, of course, Jesus Christ, or in, in Buddhist culture would be the Buddha. And the divine child transcends the level of where most human beings are. And for that reason is really fascinating to study, but not something we needed to spend too much time on today. Um, let's see. As an only child, can the two fight in you every day? Sure they can. You can have a magical child and an orphan child. You can have any combination of them. They could put up a big fist fight, Penny. That could be true. What made you create a class series about archetypes? Martha's asking me. Um, I have been studying them for a really long, since 2002. And this creative strength training originated because I began to see that there were basic tenets that I had a language for that resonated with the people I was teaching in real time back when that was. And the more I studied archetypes, the more I saw, as is also true with the chakras, that all of these systems overlap and that no one had really talked about archetypes from the standpoint of creativity in the way that I was seeing it. And I don't know why that is. But this program has gradually evolved into, and, and by no means is it a program that studies only archetypes, it's not. So I encourage you, if you have not gone to the webpage, my webpage, janedonawald.com, to read about everything that's part of CST. I interview every month guest creatives who talk about their work, artists, we talk about working in a series. We talk about working, there are all kinds of things that don't have anything to do with archetypes. So it's not really a program about archetypes. It's just that this is one thread that I think informs it from a creative standpoint in a way that a lot of people are not that familiar with. So the whole point of this lecture today was really just to give people an opportunity to hear more about an archetype that we all share in order to experience the uh, energy behind using archetypes to propel yourself forward creatively. And this year, there have been plenty of people who did not do work for the archetype exhibition, but did work consistently, regularly, without stopping during the pandemic, because they were beginning to understand how their child could help them work, how to look for joy in the world, not because you're gonna make a piece about it and not because you're gonna write an artist statement that says I am powered by archetypes, but because you develop an inner knowing of when you're sabotaging yourself, when you're victimizing yourself, when the child is poor me, poor me, and how to rise up out of that in order to succeed and be um, en enamored with the work that you're creating. I want people to find joy in what they do. And that's the bottom line for everything that's part of CST. It's a community. We talk to each other and we share the problems that we're having and we talk about goals and goal setting. And all of that is a really valuable part. And that part is way more important than whether the archetypes resonate with you or don't. And if you did go to the website and you watched the couple of interviews that are there, those are with people who are new members last year, I think in both cases or maybe lurkers. And it's not uncommon to hear somebody say, well, I don't know the archetype thing really put me off, but I figured what the hell the rest of it sounds you know, pretty good. So they went with it. And by the end of the year, they were really into seeing their world in a deeper, richer, more significant way. And that's the proof right there, I think. Uh, Penny, there are different levels of membership. There's a reading level, and then there's another level. And this year, we're making it available uh, where you can make monthly payments if you don't want to, if you can't, or for whatever reason you don't want to pay the whole amount up front. And that'll all be. I think Zen is getting ready to put that all up. I don't want to misspeak, but it, that'll be on the website by Friday. And the articles, uh, Cassie. Uh, a lot of people who've been involved in the program in the past went ahead and downloaded material as we went along. So we'll have to figure out what to do about articles 
that like if you were in it in 2017 or 2018 and you want to go back to that article, we can probably accommodate that, but I can't get in the way of my tech crew right now, so I don't know the answer. Marion. Do we, wow, great question. Do we return to the orphan child in later life when our parents die or close friends are no longer there? And maybe on some level we do, but maybe, I don't know. I, I guess I prefer to see the glasses half full whenever I can. So it makes me wonder whether when we get to that point, we may certainly have poignant memories and a sense of missing those people. I've lost, wow, out of a group that I used to be really close with and we met all the time, half of them died way be, before they should have died, one at a time because of illness. And I definitely miss them. But I think when it comes to the, the, the parental part of that, we hopefully in the maturity of our age, we choose not to think so much about that loss or get stuck in the loss, at least not indefinitely. You can be stuck in a loss and I'm not gonna fault you for that. If you've lost a mate and, and it's true of parents also. But what I like to think is that the orphan has uh, transformed into a capable adult who can not feel completely abandoned by that, but be more philosophical and be willing to dwell on all the positives that have come from it, those relationships, instead of really sinking into the loss. And maybe it's, maybe it's both. So often it's both, isn't it? We don't ever get over it. We just get better at, at moving on, I think. Sarah, this last year, did you pick people to be highlighted in the book or did they choose? I'm not sure what you mean by that. If you mean the catalog, we included everyone who entered the show via exhibitions. When we did the open call, we included everyone who entered work. It's not juried. That's not what we're about. In the archetype exhibition, <clears throat> we included everybody who submitted work, whether it was one piece. Some people could have had a whole book written about them, frankly, but we submitted, we, we included work from everyone we got and they had, uh, they could enter up to three pieces. So I didn't highlight anybody specifically. That was, that was, um, that was, what's the word I'm looking for? All inclusive, I guess. Linda, how does CST work if I'm taking the paint class, which is also 12 models? They're completely different. You do that and you do this and they're separate classes. They're not related to each other at all. Judy, uh, survival archetypes, the child is one. Um, I think I hit on that. Uh, there is depth and clarity in the patterns. And yes, I think that's completely fair. And I think it exists. This is why Carl Jung, who was the modern um, psychology guy who posed archetypes, although he wasn't, it's not like the idea had never existed, okay? He was just like the modern mouthpiece of it. And I don't even agree with his anymore because it all evolves. And so, but I do think that they are patterns that have resonated over human behavior for as long as human beings have been keeping records. And so just a reminder that the four that I'm talking about and that a lot of other people name either exactly the way I'm naming them or with slight variations are the victim. And see, these are all about how human beings relate to each other. The victim, the saboteur, the prostitute. And don't think of that as just sex and money. The prostitute is the sellout who everybody has a price. If your safety was at stake, what would you do? What behavior would that turn into for you to protect your safety? That's what that question is. And then the child. 
Uh, let's see, what is the book? I think uh, Lynn, she's talking about the catalog. So, okay, any other questions? Um, let's see, Nancy, would CST work in tandem with the botanical printing? Well, it depends on what you mean by that. The two classes are separate classes. So if you're taking a color class for me or a composition class for me, or you're taking the botanical printing class for me, those are not related to creative strength training. They're all separate things. That's like you take a class, you take four classes when you're in college, they're not related to each other. You go to botany and then you go to the gym for phys ed and then you go and take you know physics and then you go and you take psychology 101. So those classes are all separate from each other in that way. Um, I would say CST underscores everything. And if this is what you're asking me, I hope it is, you could use botanical prints to express archetypes. So you could literally do a whole series of botanical prints. And actually that's been on my radar for a while now. Um, just don't have my press and I'm just in a different mode because we moved. But I think it, it would be a fantastic idea to use botanical prints to express any number of archetypes. And I know it could be done. I know it could be done because it would be no different from finding other symbolism and incorporating it either through printing or any number of applications. Because, you know, if you watched my botanical lecture, you know, I'm big on adding MX dyes and patterns and gold leaf and drawing and printing and writing. And so the botanical print could be the basis that could be embellished with other, oh, I think I'll do that next. Yeah, it could be, you could do that, Nancy. It'd be really, it'd be good. You'd love it. Oh, let's see. Oh, thanks, Tracy. Lynn, if you're looking about the book, Carolyn, she pronounces it Mace. It's spelled M-Y-S-S. -S, and the book is Sacred Contact, crack, Concracts. <laughs> the book is Sacred Contracts. And there, Linda provided it again. The book about the archetypes, got it, yeah. And there, thanks, Monica. I need my queens to help me figure it all out. I do have a composition class that's available online, but I think it's still being migrated over to the new website, so it might not be available quite yet. And in January, I'm gonna talk about composition in my lecture series. There'll be three of those coming up, and then there'll be a link to sign up for that composition class at a discount, Noel, so just Cross your fingers and turn around twice, and by then it'll be January. It'll all work out. Okay, Michelle, thanks. Glad you were here. And yes, whoever you are, L A H, it's a course for people doing art, but it's also a course for people. It's not really a course either. We're changing that. We're gonna we're rebranding it. And I'm gonna talk about that in a live stream on January 3rd. That'll be free because this year it evolved from being a course where there were to some extent some lessons. It's no longer really a course. There are essays, there are tutorials, there are interviews to watch, there are challenges, there are exhibitions that you can participate in. And now in my mind, it is a community because one of the things that's kept us going, me personally and a bunch of the other people who participated this year, is the sense of community that comes from being in Zoom meetings together and in smaller Zoom meetings together and in writing to me and in learning who other people are and writing to them. And part of what is so important to me is that they're, go and look at the catalog for the, which is on my website, for the, um, the first exhibition, which was the CST 2020 exhibition, as opposed to the archetype exhibition, okay? Janie Crook entered a piece. It's a really cool piece. Or maybe that's even in this archetype book. I don't remember. But there, you will see when you read through those catalogs or when you look through the catalogs that there are all kinds of people who never felt comfortable making. And now they're making. They're embracing things they can do with their hands. Maybe it's something they did a long time ago and they never got back to it. There wasn't time because of a job. But there are plenty of people who are doing things for the first time. And there are plenty of people who are calling themselves artists 
for the first time because of the support in the community. And that I can't take credit for that. I'd love to, but that isn't something one person does. One person does not convince you of anything. It takes a village. It takes your own buying in and thinking that sounds like something I've always wanted to do. And now is the time. And we're gonna have some, because of some of the suggestions that, that people have made, we're gonna have some sessions for people who are signing up as we go along between now and March to talk about what kinds of where to go, where kind of videos to look at, where to, where to pick up information. So if you don't think of yourself as an artist or you don't think of yourself as creative, it'll give you, and that's one reason we're gonna put up all the archives of technique stuff that I did in 2017 and 2018, because then you could go through all that and look at that, even though that's not really where we are right now, you'll have the opportunity to look at it and learn some things and, and have some fun and play around. Let's just play around. It, it, it never hurts. It never hurts. So I hope that that will encourage you, LAH, whoever you are, to whether you do it with me or not, I don't care. I'm not here to twist anybody's arm, but I do know that anybody who goes on YouTube and starts looking at videos can find some things that are really fun to do. You could start with my channel. There's plenty of free stuff there. You could do all of that. Come back next year for CST. It's fine with me, but there are good videos that show you how to do things that are cool and fun. And that's kind of what I'm about. I want us to be cool and have fun. So, so there you go. I'm really glad you've been here and um, I don't see other questions. So I'm gonna wind up the way I always do by saying that this has been recorded and it will be up on my, um, my website and on Vimeo in the next day or so. It might take me a little time to get that organized. And remember that this is all a work in progress in the same way that you are a work in progress. So we're gonna be adding and supplementing and benefiting and why not? I'm not sitting on it all, I wanna share. And so every time you go to my YouTube channel, there'll be something new there, even if I don't see you again for a while and we've just got some good stuff going on and I want you to stay safe and have fun. Let's look for joy. So be well, write to me if you've got questions. Thanks for being here today pretty simple. Thanks. <laughs>